Hello, welcome back to Being Black with Camille Smith, and today we're welcoming Nyla. Nyla is about to complete her first year of law school at Drexel Klein School of Law. Her primary focus is to get into civil litigation and to make sure her pro bono hours are dedicated to helping underserved communities, specifically in Philadelphia. She's from Philly, born and raised, so these issues are very near and dear to her heart. She attended Drexel for her undergrad in philosophy and political science, where she spent a lot of her time incorporating intersectionality into much of her academic work. Although she's only 23, she's previously worked in a police training program hosted at the National Constitution Center for several years and a class action law firm in Haverford, Pennsylvania. So basically, stop playing with her. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm super excited to be talking to Nala today because um, I've talked about it on previous episodes before, but I think this part of my podcast, I've kind of gotten to this point that now I'm talking to people that I don't necessarily know directly. And for me, that's super, super exciting. So Nyla and I connected on my uh, podcast Instagram. And if you don't follow that, it's the Being Black Pod on Instagram, go follow. Um, and I actually asked people to send me some you know, topics that they wanted to hear about. And she actually suggested the topic that we're going to talk about today, hair discrimination, um and then I was like what if we talk and she you know was like yeah let's do that and here we are now so I'm super excited to be talking with you Nyla and without further ado what does being black mean to you so I think being black can mean a platitude of things and I think the fact that I come from a biracial household it means a lot of different things in a way that other people would interpret it but if I were to give the long you know long story short answer I would say it would mean being unique, being beautiful, and being exceptionally talented. Because there's some things in Black culture you don't find anywhere else. And that in itself is a really good flex. And that's what I think being Black means to me. So was there ever a time that you kind of first figured out that you're Black, like you might have been a little bit different from other people? Oh yeah, especially with the whole biracial aspect. So I, uh, my mom's from, her mom, my mom's family's Caribbean. And my dad is normal white guy, Donald from New Jersey. So weird combination of people. But nevertheless, I didn't realize that how big of being black was until I stepped outside the home, which was weird. You know, seeing my parents, I never like thought, oh, this combination isn't normal or societally normal. And that's because when I came home, my dad would just be like, your mom's a black woman you're a black woman and I'm a regular schmegler old white guy from New Jersey. (laughs) So that was my understanding. But when other people made it a big deal, I was like, oh, there's so many different aspects of what it means to be black and part of the black community and different aspects and dynamics that are going on. And that there's inherent privilege in the fact that I'm lighter and biracial. And so I always tell people like, yeah, I'm a biracial woman, but first and foremost, I'm a black woman because my experience was black and I never had that, I guess what typically, you know, interracial people would say like that identity crisis. When I came home, my parents were just like, black girl. <laughs> um, so then talk about growing up in Philly. So you of course had um, a biracial family. So how did that, you know, interact with going to school wherever you did? Talk a little about that. Yeah, so I, I'm from Philly and you know, Philly has numerous various different neighborhoods. Some that people are like, that's not Philly. And some people are like, oh yeah, obviously Philly. So I'm from the Maniac and Roxborough area. That's where I grew up, you know, not too far from Germantown. And I literally always tell people, if you think Maniac is not, you know, Philadelphia, it's literally across the street from Germantown. (laughs) Like Henry Avenue is the only part that separates us. So what that meant from being from Maniac slash Roxborough meant that I was in the more predominantly white neighborhood of Philadelphia which has some great memories and has a lot of horrible memories because we're talking like early 2000s this was definitely not acceptable social media didn't make it like clear and that meant a lot of discrimination a lot of racist neighbors a lot of racist kids egging your house and a lot of yeah (laughs) yeah and it's the crazy part i would sit here and go do they not know they're in philly like have they not seen black people and that part of that you know, the city was just like, yeah, we've seen them and we don't want them here. Mm-hmm. Especially those who, um, as some like, because we had clan members, <laughs> some would be like, you know, the, um, the mixed bloods, we especially don't want them. 
which really didn't deter us because my mom grew up in North. And when my dad moved from Jersey, he grew up in Albany. So that's, that was a tough combination to even try to get rid of <laughs> in the first place. Um, but when I got to high school, it was like, you know, I met everybody who I felt like I was meant to meet. I just fit right in. Like everything just felt right. Like elementary and middle school, I just always felt like the outlier. I was like, I don't like these things. They don't watch Martin. <laughs> I watch Martin. <laughs> they don't watch Sister, Sister. I'm getting to high school and I'm like, okay, this... I'm like being around people who are raised similarly to me. Mm-hmm. And then I get to Drexel undergrad and that completely flips again, which is weird because I guess I didn't click in my mind how diverse black people can be in terms of background until that point. Because though I grew up in like the suburban-esque part of Philadelphia, near and dear to my heart, I was always tell people, I'm from Philly, like I'm from Philly. That, that's where I'm raised up on. It's rough and tough. I didn't get out the mud because like, you know, I, I had a pretty good household, but I, I've experienced some rough and tough times. And when I got the drugs, it was like people who didn't know like their pigmentation and the melanin in their skin, would it affect the rest of their experience? Mm-hmm. Which meant that I would start being a lot more vocal than I was previously. Like I, I was willing to pick fights with everybody because it got to a point where people were like, you're racially ambiguous. Mm-hmm. And instead of being, at first I was offended by it because I would go home to my mom, like, I can't believe they're saying that. Like, I get it, but like, it's so rude. I would start using that to my advantage to infiltrate spaces mm-hmm. to speak on behalf of the black community that was at Drexel. Cause it was like, we may not all get along for differences of background and opinion. That is okay. What you're not gonna do is be on this campus in the center of West Philadelphia and speak on some racist stuff. And I'm not okay with that. And I'm infiltrating you because you mistaken me. So now we're here. (laughs) So now look at us. Okay, look what you did. You opened the door for me and I'm inside ruining the the atmosphere you wanted to create. Thank you. (laughs) That's, I I think that's really cool because so often I think, especially like the past like few months or so, Mm -hmm. there's been like a lot of talks around like white passing versus biracial people. Um, Even like I've seen conversations about like considering or categorizing people as biracial versus mixed, like the pros and cons of each. Um, And like what people, you know, colorism as in general, like what lighter people should be doing to help darker people, da da da, all this stuff. So I think it is cool that you, even though it was very irritating and I'm sure very frustrating at first, you kind of were like, okay, this is what people are always gonna see me as. So let me, you know, use this to my advantage to ensure that I'm, you know, speaking or vocalizing what I want to. So that's super cool. And I very, very much commend you for that. Um, Because at my, like I went to Villanova, it was just, being a black woman, as you know, like people just kind of already think that you're angry about stuff, which don't get me wrong, I am, I'm I'm angry, I am. But um, sometimes I did need to lean on certain people that white people would feel more comfortable listening to Mm-hmm. Um, and like my friends would just ensure that they understood that oh because I have x y and z privilege or oh because they're perceiving me a certain way I can help communicate you know your idea but it's still like your idea if that makes sense um, yeah as like a sidebar but um talk about do you have any advice for your younger self yeah so I'm completely different from my younger self and I don't know if I'm the dream woman that she envisioned I would be one day um I wish I was that kid who's enthusiastic the right letter to my future self I was just like yeah I'm ready to get out of middle school but (laughs) and the best case scenario that she's hoping that I am where I am and who I you know who she wanted me to be I was just telling her like your efforts don't go to waste kid like I was somebody I had a lot of confidence when I was younger and you know as puberty hits and you meet people it fluctuates as a roller coaster and I was an overachiever as a kid I don't know why, but I was. And I would just say like, your efforts don't go to waste. Like I felt like when I was younger, I worked too hard and I didn't know what I was working hard for, like at all. I was just like, I'm achieving these things. And I would have teachers trying to bring me down at the same time. Like, oh yeah, you're great, but you're not gonna achieve this. Like I remember joking to a eighth grade teacher, I wanna go to Harvard you're not going to go to Harvard. And I was like, what? Why is this lady trying to bring me down? I'm 13. Like, <laughs> But I would just say like, don't let other people's jealousies or insecurities as adults affect you. Cause guess what? You're going to rise up and you're really going to be a boss and you're going to get into law school. 
And then once you're done that, you can do whatever you want, sis. So don't let any people, you know, affect you and deter you and try to tell you what you are. You know what you are. Don't do this roller coaster of, you know, confidence levels and insecurity. You know, mm -hmm. just power through. <laughs> and that's, I think it's so funny that you mentioned that because, so I'm a chemical engineer and there were so many teachers in high school. Like I was like, you know, junior or senior year, you're thinking about colleges, you know, you're applying places, all that stuff. And I did, I did well in high school. Quite frankly, I like would consider myself a high school person. Like I was in all the clubs, I was running stuff. I was in all these like AP honors classes, whatever the case may be. And still, like even with that, even doing well in these like professors classes, I was like, yeah, like I'm thinking about chemical engineering. And like the majority of them were like, don't do that. Like you, you, like, you can't do that. And I was like, I literally have an A in this class. Like, why, yeah, right. Why would you say something like that? And I think a lot of times, something that I'm trying to learn personally is a lot of times when people are trying to like bring you down, it's very much a function of them. Like they're very much projecting their insecurities on you. And that was something that I would have to tell my younger self as well, because I feel like as a kid, you just kind of automatically respect adults. I don't know why, but like you just kind of automatically do. So when this teacher like tells you, you can't do something, you genuinely believe that for a second. It's like, wait a second, hold up. I, I can do this. And don't get me wrong, undergrad was hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we graduated, you know. <laughs> we're happy, we have a job, we're, we're good. So I like that advice. Um, but thank you for answering those. And now we're gonna segue into our actual conversation today, being black and dealing with hair discrimination. This is very important to me because I feel like my hair has always been such an important part of me even when I didn't realize it as a child um and like to give a brief backstory so I've always had like naturally curly hair mm -hmm. parents actually never allowed me to do anything to my hair um like straightening I literally would have to ask my mom and dad like to straighten my hair like months in advance I'm like there's a dance in January it's August <laughs> can I straighten my hair for that and sometimes they would still say no yeah um, and of course, I wanted to straighten my hair because a lot of the other people I was interacting with had straighter hair. Um, but, you know, looking back on it now, I feel like I'm super happy that they didn't let me, like they wouldn't let me color my hair and like nothing. Now, again, there's, you know, boundaries and like certain things that I think parents should allow their kids to explore. But I do think yeah. so that me wanting to change how I looked was very much rooted in a developing insecurity that I had based on my surroundings. So like, what was your relationship with your hair when you were younger and has that changed? Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I absolutely hated my hair and I don't think I hated it um, for like what common reasons are to hate natural and curly hair to later on. But like starting out, I hated it because there was nothing to put in my hair at the time. Like there was, I remember, what was it? Like the pink gel bottle thing from back in the day. Yeah. And that was the only thing. I feel like that you could read and it would say curly hair. It yeah. was the only thing. And then Cantu came along. And like Cantu was like watered down and gross back then. I mean, it's still pretty gross now, but like, I mean, I don't know, whatever. But there was nothing to put in it back then. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know what to do. And my hair turned out to be very thin, very frizzy. So it was like, I hate it because I don't know what to do with it. And even if I did know, there's nothing here for me to use. Like I can't go in the beauty supply store and find anything for me, but you know what I can find? Some heat protectant, <laughs> some, mm -hmm. uh, some straightening irons, a blow dryer. And you know what I'm going to do for the sake of manageability? I'm going to, what I did, fry my hair off. Mm -hmm. And it sucked because part of me was like, it was like really beautiful when I was young. Like the ringlets and stuff when you're a kid before, you know, hair is like, we're gonna be difficult. <laughs> we need products and whatever. But then you hit a point where you're like, what, 10, 11, 12, and your hair is like, we need something else. Mm -hmm. And the world doesn't have anything to provide you. So what do you do? You do what everybody else does who had natural hair. You use all the chemicals that we now know you're not supposed to use. <laughs> Bleep near bald. Um, <laughs> And that's what I did. And my mom would like be visibly distraught because she loved my hair, but she didn't know what to do with it either. <laughs> and she wore weaves at the time. And what she wasn't going to do is sew a weave in her kid's hair. 
So her kid had enough hair to just, you know, have be long and straight. And that's what I did for a very long time. Like I just had my hair straightened. My mom was straightening my hair. I didn't straighten my hair because I was very clumsy and I knew I was going to burn myself. So she would straighten my hair like all the time until it got to a point where I was like 14, 15. And I was just like, I would like to say I'm somebody who's like a lazy natural. Like I don't like having to do so much with my hair. I want it to do its own thing. So I got to a point where I was just like, I need to fix this. Like there's no reason why my hair should be ringlets at the root and straight at the ends. That don't look right to me. And what I'm not gonna do is keep losing clumps of hair because of heat. Like something's not right. These products don't even smell good. They smell like nuclear waste and I probably shouldn't be putting it in my scalp. Mm. So <laughs> I think that was around the time like mixed chicks had came out. And I vividly remember this because I was like, wow, I'm a mixed chick. I should be able to use it, right? <laughs> that was my rationale. So I started doing that. It's not working because obviously it's damage. You have to reconcile with the fact that when you have damage, you have to go through this very emotional experience where you're cutting all your hair off. And it sucks entering high school knowing that. So I waited a year before I just gave up and had my hair cut by a local black salon in West Philly who said they knew exactly how to cut curly hair. That was not the case. And somehow during this process, I came out with orange hair as well. <laughs> so we are what, like an inch off of my hair at this point in orange. What do I do? I'm 15, 16, and it's like, nobody else has fashion sense in high school, so maybe I can get by on this. Like, <laughs> maybe nobody's really gonna notice. Everybody knows this, obviously, because it's a horrible dye job, but everybody's like, oh my God, you dyed your hair. I mean, that's all fun and games, but like, I don't want this like this. So I spent a lot of time researching, and I think this is when the world was really like, oh, wait, I think black people have natural curly hair like I think they actually need things for their hair so diva curl comes out and I, I remember this timeline so well because I tell people all the time like this hair care journey is no joke like <laughs> this is like the worst diva curl comes out I'm not excited about diva curl I'm excited about diva cuts because this is like these people have to be licensed to cut curly hair a certain way they don't cut it where it's wet because you can't even tell what it looks like wet mm -hmm. um you can't tell the length you can't tell the layers diva curls come out diva cuts come out I'm like great I'm trying to find a salon I'm trying to convince my mom because my mom's of the belief that she's not going to take her black kid to a white hair salon because a lot of diva curl you know stylists were white but dad doesn't care because he doesn't know anything about hair he pays ten dollars for his haircuts up the street he, he doesn't know anything <laughs> so that that parent is useless in this whole journey <laughs> all he does is go well I think it looks great I'm sure you do <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you're useless right now, but I'm trying to convince her and reassure her that we're not going to make another big mistake in the hair journey of her child because she's of the belief that one day I'm going to end up bald. What Caribbean families don't like is bald women. So <laughs> most of the time. So I'm convincing her. We go, I get my first diva cut. It's not great. It's better than what I've had before. But little did I know that my future stylist was in that very salon. She just wasn't cutting hair because her boss wouldn't let her, even though she was far more talented in every respect, which explains a whole nother different dynamics going on there between her as a woman and him as a man owning the salon. A lot of things, because once she left and started her own business, all his clients left with her. And I was like, well, why are they leaving you? and going to her and they all have amazing hair now and mine's like pyramid like weirdly shaped <laughs> so I go there she strips that dye out of my hair we start over from black and she cuts my hair and I'm like mini fro jerry curl ish but I can't tell you I was it, I was so happy at this point in my life <laughs> because for the first time it was like this looks like hair like this looks like something, it's doing something and it's doing something good and it's looking healthy. And when I run my fingers through my own hair, I'm not going, ew, like 
my hair felt like paper at some point in my life and I'm like it's not supposed to feel like this it's not but what can I do there's nothing I can do with the resources that I have and now I have this wonderful old lady named Shelly who can cut hair for like to save her life if she wants to with a blindfold the woman cuts hair upside down sometimes because she's <laughs> like she's she's very entertaining and she's a master colorist so when I did decide to go blonde at some point which I would not recommend unless you're going through something very heartbreaking <laughs> blonde is for moments of change I didn't lose any hair with her and that was something that I was just like the fact that my hair survived a bleaching phase says a lot about the fact that this woman knows how to cut my hair and now I need to explore products that properly treat it but back when I was younger I hated my hair I hated maintaining it I hated I hated the straightening thing but I didn't know what else to do and it's not like I liked my hair more straight than curly it just what was what was normal. Yeah. Well, first of all, you might have to put me on to Shelly because I actually moved recently <laughs> and I'm not near the woman that normally would cut my hair. Not that I like mm-hmm. have to see her, but like it'd be nice. So we'll talk about that at another time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but so how do you normally wear your hair now? Like your hair is curly now. Do you normally do like wash and goes, protective styles? What do you normally do? Yeah, normally wash and goes because my hair is so soft that like braids and stuff don't last a long time. And it sucks because you pay so much for braids and then you're like, (laughs) it won't last a long time. So Mm -hmm. I'll do a braid if I'm going on a trip for sure, because TSA is very anti-natural hair, which I found out like last weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, That, that, yeah, that's a story. I stuff in here. Like I could, but what? Come on. Yeah, they also just don't let like allow natural hair care products on, which was weird. Um, I accidentally brought my taser across state lines, which is which is on me, which is on me, completely on me, just not cleaning out my bag. Um, <laughs> but I found out legally I can bring that to an entirely different state, but I can't bring my like hair care product of like my curling custard because they couldn't tell like how to measure that even though it's in the bottle but then like we don't know what kind of substance this is I'm like come on dude like you're letting me bring a taser I can't bring <laughs> but not my hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's great <laughs> so I normally wear it like wash and go okay I normally wear wash and goes too I over quarantine actually I feel like was when I started to like experiment with my hair as much because again like I really couldn't do too much to my hair when I was younger um so I mean I'm not like a master braider but I did like kind of teach myself how to do box braids um but that's what I've like been kind of doing now and then I normally have like a middle part but then I'm trying the side part now I don't know anywho um (laughs) you or do you feel like you've experienced hair discrimination like outside of oh well you can talk more about the airport but like in academic settings or in professional settings or whatever the case may be Oh, for sure. And, you know, the crazy part about it is I think I've made it very clear during undergrad and I think it's even more clear than in law school that I don't choose to bite my tongue if I think something's wrong. I would say because Drexel's Drexel's a weird university in that, like, you know, that we have the co-op, you know, situation. So we work for six months at some point during our four or five year curriculum. What that means is that you get a taste of the real world employment, you know, the real employment world and you realize what it means to have natural hair in those situations because we get classes on how to prepare for these interviews and I love these classes because (laughs) I think they're absolutely they're productive for people who have never worked a day in their life but not productive for people who have there's a section of the class where they talk about you know appearance so I'm like okay yeah you know I own blazers for days I I don't I got this Mm -hmm. right I come in and it's like, we're gonna talk about how to wear your hair. And I'm like, they better not. Please don't start me today. It's a it's a Tuesday. Like I vividly remember this. <laughs> so I choose to sit in the front row. I'm just like, I'm just very curious what they're going to say. Um, so they have diagrams and pictures. Mm-hmm. What is considered neat hair? Um, you know, by the little icons and emojis they were using, you know, straight hair. It could be down, it could be in a ponytail. But if you have curly hair, it always has to be a bun. Mm-hmm. always has to be a bun you can never have it down it can't be out because it has to be neat now it's not explicitly clear what they're trying to say but I get it I'm reading the message I'm catching the signals because if my hair was straight I could just wear it the same way I would if I rolled out of bed but I can't do that 
with a wash and go that takes some time. You gotta appreciate the effort that it takes to do this wash and go. And then I have to sit here and throw it in a bun sometimes if I wanna preserve my curls for the day. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of the start of knowing that like the way this employment situation for me on my designated career path was gonna look. And that was absolutely the case because if I did wear my hair down in job interviews, the interviewer was very much so disinterested. And I'm not saying that maybe it wasn't for other purposes. Maybe they looked at my resume and were like, no. But I like to say I'm very confident in my previous working background because I had all of that before I started the co-op stuff. So <laughs> it's not that I'm underqualified. I'm not underqualified, I think. My GPA is well above what you guys put on the thing. And I've worked, and you don't have to train me. That's the best part. We don't even have to talk. Um, <laughs> but you're visibly disinterested because you see the name, you don't know how to pronounce it, and you see the hair and you're like, I don't know, I'm just gonna have to sit in the front and that's what they're gonna say. Mm -hmm. So I do remember the interviews where I wore my hair in a bun, I always got. And the interviews where I didn't, I didn't get. And I, I did that purposefully because I didn't wanna work at certain places. But <laughs> um, when I started working at the class action firm, um, I started wearing my hair down more at some point because it was just like, I'm not going to keep throwing my hair back in a bun. It, it's, it defeats the purpose. It defeats what I want to do with like my appearance. Like I got outfits that look better with my hair down. <laughs> <laughs> and it would just be a thing where I'll be looked at. And I, I don't know, people are always just like, maybe you're reading too much into it. And I'm like, no, it's not because I'm never looked at constantly unless my hair is down or, um, there would be comments like, and I know they're not harmful or they weren't meant to be harmful, but um, at the time when I was working at the firm, I think Miss America Chesley Curse had just won like, and she had like the long curly hair, natural hair, like that was her thing. And everybody's just like, oh yeah, Nyla has that hair. And I was like, that hair? What? <laughs> what? Are you no, I don't. We have a different curl pattern. Like I was just like, <laughs> what are you talking about but it was just like yeah that hair like as if it were like a wig or something mm -hmm. as if like we had went to the same beauty supply store bought the same bundles together like besties mm -hmm. um <laughs> it was it was just weird and that's something I had already experienced on an everyday basis growing up you know random people can I touch it like as if it's a pet but what I didn't I didn't think I would experience it in like very passively aggressive or passively uncomfortable ways like in employment and that continues throughout law school and I have no issue with it because I'm at the point now where it's like I'm gonna get this JD whether y'all like it or not and y'all are gonna have to hire me because y'all need lawyers and y'all especially need black women lawyers because we only make up two percent in the entire nation so with that being said how much is the salary so <laughs> <laughs> exactly but experiencing it like very passively and in the workplace was weird yeah. and it's something that I realized would continue whether I liked it or not and it's hard when it's passive because you can't really say much on it without appearing to the stereotypical black woman trope that she's sensitive or she's angry mm -hmm. I have so much to say so first I also I didn't have like an actual class but we did have one class that they tried to incorporate in like professional development-esque thing. And of course it was the same sort of um, lecture, if you will. I'm sure the same, they use the same icons and stuff like that. Um, but actually I had a legitimate experience that one of my professors actually told me to my face because um, he would normally um, like look at our resumes and like he was like the person in the department to talk to about things like that. And he was like, oh, like, career fairs like this week like well, basically remember to put your hair up I was like <laughs> now looking back on it I do think that like because I didn't I just kind of brushed it off and like kept going because he was like he's considered one of like the more difficult professors in mm -hmm. my and I was going to see him the next semester as well so I was like should I fight with him right now but I do distinctly remember the following semester that he was talking about something similar to like professional development. And I also wear hoops all the time. Like I think curls and hoops, they just go together personally. Um, and he was talking about 
my, he actually brought up my hoops and was like, yeah, like those are the biggest earrings I've ever seen. And it's like, oh, it's funny. Cause like, I literally have larger ones. Yeah. <laughs> casual ones that I wear. I was like, but I can wear like my larger ones like the next day. And he like got real quiet. And I was like, no, no, no. Like seriously, like why me out of all the people? Because there was one other white girl in the class that was wearing hoops too. And like, before I ended up leaving his classes, I was like, hey, like, I understand that you might try to be, you might be trying to say these things out of, you know, positivity and like, you want me to get a job, all that stuff. But like, that's very harmful, especially if I didn't already know where I stand with my hair, like that'd be so harmful. And even like going to career fairs, like I wouldn't actually put my hair up just because I didn't want to give interviewers or companies a reason to turn me down because similar to you, like I'm very comfortable with my resume. I have a lot of work experience, especially in what I'm doing. Um, but for this job that like I'm actually doing now, like my first full-time position, I had the conversation with my dad before I started. And I was like, honestly, like if they don't feel comfortable with me having my hair out, considering that's how I'm going to wear my hair literally every day that I go into lab, or even if they don't feel comfortable with me wearing my hoops, because I wear my hoops every day when I go into lab, I don't need to be working for them. And I think right. it's like kind of like a liberation step that it was like, if they don't feel comfortable with me having my hair out, then like, I'll find somewhere like someplace else. But now it is difficult because there are other black, you know, scientists that work with me and it is like the always being mistook for one another. Yeah. Again, different hair patterns, different curl types. A lot of like my one coworker is darker than me. My other coworker is lighter than me. I'm like, we look, we all just look different. I, you're just not trying hard enough. Um, so I, I think from the standpoint that I've faced actual hair discrimination, I can definitely resonate with what you've said, like always feeling the need to put your hair up in professional settings. If you don't, and you don't get a job, always kind of always having to like be really critical and think about it. And I don't think that it's a function of us being sensitive. Like we observe things, but because they're microaggressions, like we can't actually comfortably call them out because there's an easy way to like, diverted if like someone were to be confronted about it when it comes to hair I feel like people feel more comfortable being passive aggressive or doing microaggressions as opposed to being like I don't like your hair but I will say one of my coworkers did try to touch my hair and I was like I've never touched you at work never I've never thought about putting my hands on you ever at work we are literally two scientists. I was like, I'm an engineer, she's a scientist. And that's not like a hierarchy type thing, but like, mm-hmm. you're both women in STEM. There is no reason for you to be trying to touch my hair. You, I literally the other day, I was like, oh my gosh, like your hair looks so nice. I wasn't like, yeah, <laughs> let me touch it. No, 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 your hair looks nice. There, even if I wanted to touch it, there would literally be never, there would never be a scenario in a, a professional setting that I would ever ask to touch someone's hair. No, even if they were like, no, touch it. I'd be like, I believe you. I believe that it's soft um and from that standpoint I felt very I walked away from it feeling like much more comfortable that I was like because in high school middle school like I let people do that to me and I would just be so upset and irritated (laughs) (laughs) am I being sensitive no like I'm not a pet this is not a petting zoo yeah you touching it's making it frizzy this wash and go took a long time or these braids or like you asking whether or not it's my hair or not who cares who cares? Truly. You didn't buy it. Because if I bought the bundle, <laughs> it's mine. <laughs> okay. You don't have to worry about it. You didn't buy it. So. Exactly. Unless you're buying it for me, leave it alone. Mind your business. And even then, a gift, after you give the gift, it's not even your business. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I think as a curly haired person, um, like going through life has just been very like, weird if you will Mm -hmm. like middle school is always just going to be weird just in general because kids are mean um but do you have any advice for like other curly haired girls that are going through that you know time period or even if you have advice for um girls our age like do you have like a favorite product if you will things like that oh yeah okay i were to recommend something and i'm not going to recommend anything that's like mad expensive because I'm a drugstore queen (laughs) it's not there I don't want it (laughs) I like Aunt Jackie's and I like it because it's light and summer is coming up y'all and y'all don't want to have to be spending nothing like too heavy with like shea butter base Mm -hmm. but I like Aunt Jackie's I like the curling custards 
they have like a flaxseed gel, which is great that if like you're going through a shrinkage issue right now, not really an issue, but you hate your shrinkage and you're in like your hair growth journey. That's really nice because I cut three inches off my hair like, I don't know, maybe two months ago and I have it in now. So like, obviously it's not supposed to be this length, but that's what the length it is right now. Um, and advice, I guess like for younger girls, I would say, cause I'm not sure what the curly hair experience would have been for us had we had Instagram or something of the sort. Cause I'm not sure if there's solidarity in seeing how many naturals there really are in the world. But with that being said, now that we are aware of how many naturals exist, there's a whole different issue as far as like texture discrimination within that community in and of itself. So if I were to give any advice in terms of somebody's natural hair, curly hair journey, I would probably just keep it a bean and just be like, that texture doesn't have to be your texture and your texture is yours. Work with that. And that's gonna be a-okay, okay? Like there's, and you mentioned it earlier, like, you know, the colorist, you know, debates and what it means to be mixed and what it means to be biracial. I was very, you know, much so raised in a very straightforward household where details were just like, that makes no sense to me. And that's really how I carry on about life a lot of times. Like, this debate makes no sense to me. Like, I get it, but it's like, we're delving too much into it. Black is black to me a lot of times. Put the put the biracial or the mixed label before to acknowledge your privilege and your, comp your composition. I hate saying it like that, but put it there because you do have an inherent privilege by, you know, being of a more racially ambiguous, you know, appearance. But acknowledge that you're black at the end of the day. We all have the same struggle at some point, whether it's more prominent or not. And that being said, when it comes to texturism and, you know, textural um, issues within the black community, it, your, your hair's fine. You're like, that's literally, what I'm just gonna keep it as like, your, your hair is literally fine. Like there's nothing wrong with it. What you wanna do with it is your business. Keep it healthy, healthy hair is happy hair. And that's all I would say. Like, I don't think there is a push for, or there should be a need to have longer hair because people think longer hair is more attractive. At some point people loved pixie cuts, okay? It's gonna change. Instagram's not, Instagram's not gonna determine your life despite what people may think. And if you feel as though that you are feeling inadequate based on your hair or your hair texture, you need to log off and just focus on you. Like there's really no reason to let everybody like determine what they think is attractive. Worry about you, okay? Cause all you have in the, end of the day is really this hair sometimes and your skin. I say that about that too. Like all you have is your hair and your skin. So <laughs> take care of them. Do what works for you, not what other people determined is attractive to them. You're not here to please them. You live one life, okay? You're gonna leave it alone. This is sad, but you're gonna leave this life alone. So you might as well live it for yourself as much as possible. Appearance wise, you know, value wise, and you know, goal wise, that's on you. I'll just keep it there. <laughs> yeah, no, I like that too. Cause I didn't, I really hadn't thought about and like, I think after, honestly, after I graduated college last year or undergrad, I took like a very hard look at like the people that I follow. Mm -hmm. And I don't follow a lot of people. If you're watching this and I followed you, it's most likely not beef. It's just more like, I wanted to follow people that look like me and like that I enjoyed, you know, seeing the content on a regular basis. Um, and I really don't know how seeing so many naturally curly Hair, yeah. hair people or just influencers in general would have affected me as a, a kid because I really didn't my older sister normally wears her hair straight my mom and my dad both have short hair so like I was really the only person in my immediate family that like wore their hair out um so that's actually very interesting but I couldn't agree more just like accept what you have because it's not going to change yeah um, ask for help you can reach out to us if you need product recs. I'm always trying new products. It's a problem because I keep buying hair products, but. Uh, yeah. I have like an entire bar stand in this corner of my room as a product hair junkie. I just want to say I'm a proud product hair junkie because I don't buy stuff that doesn't work. I just, <laughs> I just have a lot. <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. Um, but no, I really, really appreciate this conversation. I think um, for, at least for my younger self that I would have loved to see a conversation between two curly haired girls um, talking about something like this um, and being so honest about it because that's something else too. I feel like because our, um, like we mentioned before, it can be very passive aggressive. Like sometimes mm -hmm. in your head, you don't know whether it's a real thing or not. It is a real thing. 
It shouldn't be happening. We should all feel comfortable with our natural hair in any space we find ourselves in, especially professional spaces. Um, but I'm gonna wrap it up. Do you have anything else that you want the audience to know? Um, there's nothing in particular, but if you do need law school help, you know, I know the pandemic is really like prevalent and real, and I already know that JD and like law school help and resources are already very slim. My DMs are always open for anybody who really needs law school admissions help. <laughs> there are ways to finesse. You do not have to pay a thing, y'all. You really don't have to. <laughs> they don't tell you that, but as somebody who's a very straightforward person was like, I need money and I don't care. Um, my DMs are always open to those. And if you like have curly hair questions, I will literally procrastinate everything <laughs> to answer those. So feel free. Awesome. Okay, so I'll put um, Nyla's Instagram in here. Um, again, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk with me today. And for those watching, please be back next week for another Being Black episode. Bye.